Good afternoon. Welcome to plenary session five. The, uh, I'm John Lipsky from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington. And I have the honor of moderating this panel on the politicization of the international system of payments and the future of the international monetary system, a small topic. But happily, we have a truly all-star panel of, uh, of experts in, the, in this field. And I'm sure we're going to have illuminating and interesting discussions. They hardly need any introduction. And I, since we're running late, I don't want to spend too much time other than you can read along with me. Jeffrey Friedin, the prof government professor from Harvard. Akinari Hori, who is a now special advisor and member of the board of directors of the Canon Institute for Global Studies, but long uh, stalwart of the Bank of Japan. <laughs> professor Helen Ray, professor of economics at London uh, Business School, and uh, of course, well known in, uh, in international economic circles for her uh, important work in, the, in this area. Uh, Sergei Sorchak, deputy finance minister of Russia and a long uh, veteran of G20 meetings and uh, where these issues have been discussed. And of course, last and definitely not least, Jean-Claude Trichet, who definitely needs no introduction in this, uh, in this, in this uh, venue. So let me just begin by uh, giving a, a few basic facts that set the stage for this issue of the future of the international monetary system. One is, of course, the dominance of the US dollar in the US system. Some, a few factoids. Global GDP in 2019 at market rates, about what in America we'd say 88 trillion dollars, or 88,000 billion, I guess, in, in European parlance. International reserves that are often focused on in this context actually only represent less than 12 trillion, or 12,000 billion. In other words, a small percentage of the global GDP. Daily turnover in the Forex market this year was estimated by the Bank for International S uh, Settlements at $6.6 .6 trillion every day. $6,600 billion every day. In other words, a vastly larger sum than GDP and an incredibly larger sum than international reserves. And according to the BIS, of the t daily turnover, 88% of all transactions have the dollar at least on one side. The euro, 32%. The yen, 17%. And a number that may surprise you, China's RMB, 4%. So let me just give a quick potted history of how we got here. The dollar's dominance in the international system began with the end of World War I, but it was formalized in the Bretton Woods system, agreed at the end of World War II. That system, a dollar exchange standard, had the dollar at its center. It was intended to be a global system but the Soviet Union declined, although they participated in the negotiations, declined to, to participate in the system, instead formed a, a competing system, Comic-Con. The dollar's dominance survived the end of the formal Bretton Woods system in the sense of move to floating exchange rates, survived the oil shock, survived the Latin debt crisis, and in 1990, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the entry of China and India into the global trading system began the period of what I call true globalization, and the dollar remained dominant again. Subsequently came the tequila crisis, the Latin debt crisis in the mid-90s, the Asian currency crisis of the late 90s, the dot-com uh, recession, the, dot -com, the bursting of the dot-com bubble, and eventually the global financial crisis of 2007, 8, 9. One of the constants of this period was that the US, US GDP throughout this period was declining as a percent of global GDP. 
and yet the dollar remained dominant. Two other factors are important here, especially in the context of our, of our theme of the politiz politicization of the system, was the beginning of the use of widespread and uh, often broadly sanctioned sanctions. First were the, uh, I think, the, in this context, what uh, we call FATF, but here it's called the Groupe d'Action Financière, to combat uh, money laundering and uh, the financing of terrorism, uh, began an, an effort to put roadblocks that are essentially for political goals, as well as economic policy goals, that have now been ramped up in a unilateral way by the US. So what we look at is trade conflict that the BAS panel just dealt with also encompassed the use by the US of selective payment sanctions for, uh, uh, for political reasons, taking advantage of the centrality of the US financial system and the dollar-based system and the US banking system in that, in that context. There was an interesting speech at the uh, Federal Reserve's Jackson Hole uh, gathering symposium this year by Mark Carney, the, out, the governor of the, uh, of the Bank of England. He said the old consensus was that flexible inflation targeting and floating exchange rates were the best way to conduct policies. And in that context that there were modest gains for international policy cooperation. However, a rethinking of the current circumstance focuses on dominant currency pricing that reduces the impact. If, if everything's priced off of dollars, it reduces the impact of domestic monetary policies and reduces the ability of exchange rates to act as shock absorbers. All of this despite, again, the trend decline of US GDP as a percent of the total. So we now have a much more integrated global rate setting, as has become very clear in the last few years, and a sense of reduced monetary independence on the part of central banks, and a concern that has been quite heightened by the recent developments in economic, or recent economic developments in that the US economy has seemed out of sync with other advanced economies. Growth has been stronger. And hence, if the dollar centrality has been increased in many ways in its impact on the effectiveness of monetary policy elsewhere, the question remains, is this advisable? Uh, Mark Carney suggested that in the long run, we would want and need a multipolar international system. He suggested the creation, in fact, of something quite speculative, a synthetic hegemonic currency, <laughs> which is quite a step. So let me now turn to the panel and ask them to comment on, as they wish, on three broad themes. One, or as they wish, but suggest three broad themes. One. What are the elements that have explained the dollar's continued dominance in the context of the US economy shrinking, not absolutely, but in relative terms relative to the rest of the economy? Is it, should we expect as a matter of course that eventually that shrinkage, relative shrinkage, will tend to uh, diminish the dollar's dominance? And where is the system likely to go, and where should it go? We're going to ask for commentary across the, uh, uh, the panel. Start with Jeffrey. Great. Thank you, John. Um, well, as John has pointed out, the dollar maintains and has maintained its dominance in international monetary relations, international trade and payments. And there are a variety of reasons, many of which John mentioned. Um, it's due to its historical reserve currency role. It's due to its usefulness as a vehicle currency for international trade and payments. It's due to network externalities, so that the more people use the dollar, the greater the incentive to use the dollar and things along those lines. But I'm going to focus on a somewhat different angle, 
um, which is perhaps, I hope at least within my comparative advantage as a political economist rather than an economist, which is that it also depends on features of America's domestic monetary and financial conditions. The expectation of monetary stability in the U.S., the expectation of a commitment, uh, the expectation of financial depth, that is a broad and deep financial market, and the expectation of a high level of financial and commercial openness. All of these, I think, have been important to the international role of the dollar. The expectation that the Fed and the American monetary and financial authorities would stand behind both the value of the currency and the openness of America's fin financial market. All of these are highly political. Dollar dominance has rested in large part, in my view, on the expectation that the American political order would protect and defend the real value of the U.S. currency, that it would protect and defend the stability and the openness of its, internet, of its financial system. And I think that theory and history both tell us that these are central to the international role of any currency, including the dollar. Right? Um, and I think that this focus, by the way, on the importance of domestic politics and the political support for monetary stability, for an open financial system, for financial stability, helps explain the difficulties of the euro, given the unsettled nature of the politics of money and finance within the eurozone, and the difficulties of the, the uh, uh, Chinese currency, the RMB, given the non-transparent nature of politics in China and significant doubts about the stability of the country's financial institutions. So it is the domestic, the political will of the American authorities that I think in many ways stands behind the willingness of people around the world to continue to, do the, to use the dollar. Now, for the first time since the 1930s, as the panel earlier, the previous panel points out, for the first time since the 1930s, there are some really significant questions being raised about the extent to which the United States is in fact committed to the core principles that have underpinned the international role of the dollar. This is worrying, worrying for anyone who is concerned both about the dollar but more generally about the international monetary and financial system. And fortunately or unfortunately, we have some historical precedent. In the 1920s and early 1930s, the US was the world's largest lender, the world's largest foreign direct investor, the world's largest trading nation. It was also deeply committed to isolationism, therefore deeply, deeply hostile to international economic cooperation to the extent that Congress prohibited any American, any agent of the American government to participate in international economic conferences. The weakness of the international monetary, commercial, financial order of the interwar period, in my view, stems in large part from the fact that its most important player was non-involved politically and in many ways hostile to international cooperation. And I'm sorry to say, and to agree with Marcus Nolan and some of the others on the previous panel, that it looks like the U.S., certainly it has gone back in that direction, and there are important indications that, is, that, that it may continue to move in that direction. So that leads us to your final question, or one of your final questions, which is can the international monetary system go on if confidence in American political stability and American economic and financial leadership erodes, and specifically to the case of sanctions, if fears about the politicization of the payment system grow? My answer would be sure it can go on, and we have a, in a very small way, a bit of a precedent, which is the Cold War. During the Cold War, because the Soviets were concerned, Soviets and their allies were concerned about the politicization of the payment system, they began parking their dollar reserves in London banks, which they felt were off limits or probably off limits to the American authorities, um, and to protect them from potential seizure by the American authorities. The results were the, the euro markets, the offshore markets, um, which have become the basic form of contemporary international finance. So there are workarounds that people can come up with on the payment side. But if this is going to be a longer term phenomenon that affects not just the Soviets or not just one segment of the international order and involves an American withdrawal in some sense from this leadership position or it's, or it's making its leadership contingent on playing by American rules, then it, it presents a problem for the other members of the G7 or the OECD or the G7 or the G20. In my view, those countries could, if they wanted to, create both a financial system and a payment system that bypasses the U.S. It would be costly, it would be difficult, but it's doable. Is it a good thing? In my view, no. 
because we lose a substantial amount of the scale and history that are the history of stability that I at least would associate with the US dollar. But we have to take stock of what has been happening in the US and some of the trends that have been talked about, for example, in the previous panel in the United States. What if reality, what if the reality of American politics continues to give us a United States that is unreliable, that is populist, that is economically nationalistic, that is geopolitically aggressive? Then, I think, the world has no choice to move forward without the US. And sadly, as an American, I'm very sorry to say that the probability that the US continues to move in this direction is not zero. Thanks. OK, thank you. Hi. Please. Um, the international monetary system uh, has been one of my most favorite topics of discussion since the 1980s, when I was an economist at the BIS. Actually, I published a paper, BIS economic paper, entitled Reserve Currency Diversification in 1986. And uh, things have hardly changed over the decades. Uh, so <clears throat> let me explain. And some of the statistics have already been mentioned by uh, John uh, and, and, and partly Jeff. I hope you can read uh, a table, maybe no. too small for you. Uh, uh, that table is taken out from the, um, uh, the central bank survey conducted by 53 central banks and aggregated by the BIS every three years. And uh, as John said uh, a few minutes ago, daily turnover of global forex market amounted to $6.6 .6 trillion. Uh, and the BIS shows uh, its currency distribution by percentages, whose total being 200% rather than 100% because uh, you know exchange takes a pair. <laughs> uh, on that basis, uh, because the table is so small, let me uh, let me uh, pick up some statistics. As John said, the dollar captures 88% in the 2019 survey, this year's survey. Uh, Dollar's proportion remained virtually unchanged uh, at 90 or a little less since the BIS began its survey in 1989. Uh, the first column says, uh, what, uh, 88 or 89 or something. The second and third uh, currencies actively traded on the forex market are the euro and the Japanese yen. Uh, toward uh, the left uh, end, in 1989, uh, there was no euro, of course. I combined the Deutsche Mark, French franc, and other EMS currencies to come up with a number of uh, hypothetical uh, euro in 1989, uh, 80, uh, sorry, 33%, okay. While uh, the euro actually, actually captured 32% in 2019, okay. Uh, big change by one percentage point. <laughs> the yen had a share of 27% in 1989, uh, the peak of the bubble economy of Japan, which dropped to 17% by 2007. Uh, that is not shown in that table. Uh, but uh, Japanese yen's number uh, has since fluctuate, fluctuated around 20. Uh, in short, uh, the currency market hardly changed, as I said, as far as the distribution, distribution of major currencies are concerned. Now, let's look at the uh, emerging uh, markets economies' currencies. In 2001, the renminbi ranked 35 on the currency league table with a negligible percentage share, but moved up to 8 with 4.3% share in 2019. Big increase. Other emerging economies also increased percentage shares uh, as illustrated on the graph on the right uh, bottom panel. Uh, big increase, but the number numbers are small anyway. So despite these salient increases, however, the presence of emerging market uh, uh, currencies is still pretty small in contrast to the size of their GDP and international trade of goods and services. Now, uh, let's discuss uh, 
uh, qualifications of the international uh, currency, uh, Jeff Frankel, Peter Kennan, and all those uh, economic experts pointed out several conditions. Number one, economic size. Number two, develop, developed financial markets. Number three, confidence in the value of the currency. Number four, inertia. That's the favorite, you know. First of all, the economic size, but economic size does not immediately entail a wide international of the use of the currency. The US dollar, for example, it was in the late 19th century uh, that the US economy overtook the UK economy, uh, and so did German economy, actually. But both the US dollar and Reichsmark failed to impress the market. And uh, at that time, pound sterling continued to be the international currency. Okay. Uh, Jeff pointed out the US politics mattered in that regard because of US isolation policy. Uh, it may be true, uh, here's a point. But I think demand side elements also matter. You know, uh, in my opinion, market confidence matters a lot for an actively used international currency. It's not only uh, a confidence in the value of the currency, but confidence in its integrity that matters. You know, the integrity of a currency is maintained uh, only when it functions properly as a means of exchange, unit of account, and store of value. Uh, to be a little more specific, um, the monetary authorities have to create and maintain a system so as to ensure reliable uh, means of payment, wide, deep financial markets, supported <laughs> by many down-to-earth uh, elements. For example, banknote counterfeit deterrence capabilities, legal stability and the transparency of rules and regulations, as well as law enforcement capability over financial fraud and wrongdoings. And last but not least, the political and economic independence of the central bank from both domestic and international pressures. So, now let me turn to potential competitors of the US dollar. First, the renminbi. It's so obvious to me that uh, there is a long, long way for the Chinese currency to go before it gains confidence in the market on all the accounts I discussed. Uh, in my opinion, it is highly unlikely that the renminbi becomes the you know, uh, vehicle currency in the market this century, maybe next century. Okay, what about the euro? Uh, of course, the euro has a natural, appe natural appeal, and in fact, it's the second international currency. But in order for the euro to play a bigger role, its financial markets need to become much wider and deeper. Uh, German bonds markets, uh, French Trésor market, are the most actively traded markets in euros uh, at the moment, but, the, but their sizes are small. Uh, and liquidity are thin in comparison with the U.S. Treasury market and JGB's market. Uh, I think governments within the EU could begin um, uh, to appeal the market by, you know, uh, issuing uh, common euro bond, of course. Um, they don't have to create a big, uh, you know, uh, big project of, uh, you know, consolidation of all individual countries or budget, whatever. I think uh, they could uh, begin by, um, say, um, issuing, uh, s you know, uh, euro, euro denominated bond uh, collectively, uh, covering a small part of Euro EU common budgets. Uh, like, uh, you know, common defense or refugees assistance or uh, space program, whatever, you know, um, before encompassing a wide array of their budgets. Okay. I have actually argued this point for a long, long time uh, with my uh, colleagues in the European uh, central banking uh, circles, but uh, to our regret, Little progress has been made. I'm sorry. Um, what about the SDR and others? 
suffice it to quote Charles Kindleberger, who I remember referred to the SDR as the artificial language Esperanto in finance. And, uh, and uh, okay, uh, gold he compared with Latin, okay, yeah. and the US dollar with English, okay. <laughs> so I thought uh, that that analogy was pithy and I continue to do so after three decades. I'm, uh, I, I'm afraid I'm, uh, you know, uh, you know, spent uh, most of the allotted time, but, but, but last, last, last word for maybe 30 seconds. I like to discuss what uh, Jeff Frieden uh, discussed a few minutes ago. It's not Mr. Trump. Uh, several years ago, the US government under President Obama tried to use its clout over a global uh, financial system as economic sanction against Russia and, uh, and Iran. It was reported then that the uh, US might even try to limit Russian banks' uh, access to SWIFT, the global message transfer system. Uh, even before Mr. Trump became POTUS, the Chinese began to worry about, uh, about the possibility of its application to China and tried to uh, modern modernize renminbi payment and settlement systems and widening the scope for international use of the renminbi. In recent years, Chinese concern, concerns have become greater. For example, Yu Yongding, my friend and former member of the PBOC uh, Monetary Committee, wrote an article on a Japanese magazine in July this year, saying that the US might deprive Chinese banks of their access to SWIFT or CHIPS in New York. So uh, he said uh, China should internationalize the renminbi. Okay. So let me stop here. Helen. Thank you very much, John. Um, I think what is truly remarkable is that even though uh, Bretton Woods essentially collapsed with a run out of the dollar, ever since 1973, in effect, if anything, the dominance of the dollar has risen uh, in the international financial system. And we have seen a lot of figures. I won't come back uh, on these figures. Um, but uh, I think it's certainly due both to phenomena linked to network externalities and all that but also simply to the, to the complementarity uh, that is very present in the use of an international currency, complementarity between the different use of a currency. If you are financing in a currency, then you want liquidity in that currency, you transact in that currency, then you want your exchange rate to be pegged in that currency, then your central bank has reserve in that currency, then the transaction costs are low in that currency, et cetera, et cetera. So there are complementarities both within the private sector and across the public sector and, and the private sector. And this makes an equilibrium very, very hard to, uh, uh, to change. We have seen that with sterling, we are seeing that with the dollar. Now, does it matter? So in fact, if anything, I think the current research in, uh, in economics, in, uh, in academia, shows that it matters even more than what we thought in the past. So there are lots of papers now that show that uh, this business about dominant currency invoicing, the fact that a lot of, um, of goods are invoiced in dollar, is very important for monetary policy. It's also important for the volume of global trade. We see this amazing correlation, at this stage I would still call them correlation, between uh, the valuation of the dollar, so for example the dollar strengthening, and the decline in global volume of trade. And the effects are, are these correlations are big. So that's one. We also see these, um, these big effects of the Fed on uh, global financial condition, the global financial cycle, and that actually affects everyone. So I would say, if anything, it seems to matter more from an economic point of view than, than maybe what we thought before. Now there's also obviously, and we have seen this in the 2008 crisis, the international lender of last resort function, which has proved, I would say, pretty crucial. 600 billion uh, you know, dollar liquidity which went uh, in central bank swaps to, to help the international financial system. And obviously, so that was not the IMF because the IMF cannot print dollar, that was, that was the Fed which is providing the liquidity. And that means a lot from the point of view of um, geopolitical power, also from the point of view of, of economic uh, benefits. So the system uh, has been relatively stable 
since uh, you know, the Second World War with one hegemon, the, the US dollar and, and the United States, and I guess Charles Kindleberger would agree that that's hegemonic stability for you, and that seems to have, to have worked to some extent. But now, how long is it gonna last? I guess it's a big question, right? And, and there, I see so two reasons why things might be changing, and then I will be very brief about you know, where, we might, uh, where we might be going. So the two reasons are one which has already been, <laughs> been mentioned here, which is that you know, things are stable if you have a relatively quasi-benevolent hegemon. Now, if you have a hegemon who starts being over-politicizing uh, the currency and, uh, and really using it for all kinds of purposes, trust evaporates, and that tends to, to speed up the exit of, of the current equilibrium. And we, have, we certainly see that. Okay, right now, I would say. So that's one, one factor. The second factor is a little bit more of a trend. And uh, that's what I call the new Trifin dilemma. So let me tell you what was the Trifin dilemma, and then I will tell you what the new Trifin dilemma, so we see if you, if you agree with me. So the, the original Trifin dilemma, it was in the 1960s, and it was Robert Trifin, who was professor at Yale at the time, was explaining that if you have a fixed, uh, or more or less fixed reserve of, of gold in the United States, and the dollar was backed by gold and picked at a fixed parity, well, if the liquidity in dollars in the rest of the world was growing and growing, eventually if people wanted their dollars back into gold, there wouldn't be enough gold for everyone, essentially, and therefore that can create a crisis of confidence. You start to think that you're dollar is not going to be wor worth the parity in gold because there's just not enough gold reserves. Hence a possible run out of the dollar, which did happen, so Trifin essentially uh, predicted it in some sense, uh, and that was the collapse of, of Bretton Woods, and there was a run out of the dollar into Deutsche Mark, etc. Now, we don't have any more an international monetary system backed by a commodity. It's just, just not the way it works. We have flexible exchange rate and fiat currencies. However, you think about what is the confidence in the dollar, well, essentially it's the fiscal backing of a currency. People still want dollar as a reserve currency because in crisis times, and we have seen it in 2008 very much, and we still see it, when, when things go badly, the value of the dollar, if anything, goes up. Okay, and, and we might see even flight to safety in the dollar. And this is because of the credibility, in a sense, of the fiscal backing uh, of the United States. So now picture yourself a world in which we have the fiscal capacity of the US, okay, and we have a relative size of the US going tremendously down in the world economy. So now we have a lot of liquidity outside the US, a lot of dollar liquidity in the world. There's a huge demand for US treasuries, as we know. <laughs> but we have this uh, shrinking hegemon in the, in the middle. The relative size of the US goes down. Now, at some points, clearly, I think, there will be also a confidence crisis. There just won't be enough fiscal, fiscal support to, to back this whole dollar liquidity in the world economy. Now, when will that happen? I have no idea. Uh, and of course, also to, for, the, for the crisis of confidence to realize itself, you need to be able to run out of the dollar into something else, okay? And this is where I go to the third point. So, I do believe we are going to go to a more multipolar world because of this fundamental trend and also uh, given the behavior of the current uh, government in the US. When, I don't know. But so what will be the possible substitutes there? So clearly, number two, the euro. Okay, what's missing for the euro right now? A safe asset. Uh, it's missing to complete the financial architecture of the euro area, okay? So for the euro to become a more important currency, we miss the same thing that would make the euro area more stable. So that would be a policy goal, and I think it had been neglected, but I think Europeans are becoming a little bit more aware of that, and, and there's a lot more attention given to these matters, at least I hope, uh, now. So, so that's, that's the euro story. The RMB, the RMB clearly there is a political will, as we've seen from the data, we're still way below you know, what it would require for an international currency to, to be viable, form of convertibility, liquidity of market, etc. But there's clearly a push from the, from the Chinese authority. And uh, given the size of China, I think if there is, at some point, things start to move, they could move actually maybe quicker than, than we expect. And, and one reason for that was that for the moment, maybe we, you know, we see a whole 
area in the world economy which is more or less pegging to the dollar, stabilizing its exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, but by doing so, it's also stabilizing its exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis China because they are shadowing a little bit each other. And if at some point we see a decoupling between China and the dollar, it could be that actually the true economic area because of the trade links, et cetera, is the Chinese economic area rather than the dollar one. And so this could actually speed things up maybe quicker than, than we think. But we are still not there for sure. And then I would just say one, one last thing, which is, you know, we've seen recently some contests coming from the private sector. You know, Libra will probably not happen, we don't know, but or other things like that. So why? Because these things build on an existing network. Of course, they lack any other good functions of money, et cetera. So again, I don't think it's a viable proposition, but at least in terms of scale, I think that's something that is really new because of the existing network, which could right away play in the medium of exchange function, but of course doesn't have any fiscal backing. This is why, by the way, the synthetic hegemonic, uh, or synthetic, uh, uh, hegemonic currency of Mark Carney, which is like, of a, a, you know, like an SDR, but with digital currency, is also not gonna fly, because for the same reason the SDR did not fly, because it doesn't have the liquidity provision and the, the fiscal backing. Sir. Thank you, John. Uh, with your permission, before I make some comments, I would like to ask the audience one question. Uh, does everyone agree that uh, national currency, which is being used and circulated within the national uh, border, is a public good. I think uh, everyone is agree with this. Can be. Should be. So, if it is positive answer, on the basis of previous speaker said, can we declare with some thinking about that the uh, uh, US dollar is a global public good? Unfortunately, for many of people, uh, the answer under recent conditions, under recent circumstances, under the figures shown on the screen, the answer can be only positive. Yes, we can like it or dislike it, but US dollar is a global public good. So shall we blame the dollar itself for different kinds of uh, policy actions and utilization of the currency by different people, by different authorities. I don't, I don't think sure that we should blame the dollar itself. It is an X which can be used either for constructing houses or taking lives. The same story with the dollar. So from, based on this observation, I can see that the biggest issue for multipolar world for multilateral relationship is the responsibility of those who issue the reserve currencies. And nowadays, it's not only uh, one single uh, currency, but in principle, the responsibility of authorities of reserve currency economy or reserve currency nation. So we can speak about substitution, dollar for RMB, and B, dollar for Euro, dollar for everything, but responsibility will rest with the authority. So my judgment at this point is that what we really need is to start working on the rules, principles, high level principles, guidelines, we can call it differently, on the behavior of reserve currency nation. So uh, the movement to the, to the directions will save us quite a lot of uh, uh, for uh, energy, at least, uh, because when we substitute, we will have the same uh, the story, whether on, on which way the uh, national currency as a reserve currency have been used by national authorities. So we are living in the world when the, and the title of our panel, when the uh, uh, monetary system or I would better say that infrastructure for a financial infrastructure of a, one particular country is being used as a political weapon. It's a very ba really bad story. So, but it is happening and we somehow need to accommodate to it. And we are accommodating. For example, uh, there's decisions to develop 
special payment system within the European Union in order to uh, make settlements with uh, trade when we are trading with Iran. The uh, decision are taken by Central Bank of Russia to decrease the um, portion of uh, U.S. Treasury in our international reserves. So it can be done in different way. But what is really interesting about U.S. dollars, you cannot escape the fact that the biggest invoicing is taking place in U.S. dollar. Well, it is easy to say to, the, to speak about the international trade in general, but what was much more important is invoicing. You can make settlement in any different countries, as happening in my case, for example. We allow our obligas, our debtors, for example, when we grant uh, state credits to foreigners, pay what where they want, rubles, euros, dollars, whatever. But invoicing still in the dollars. Even when we uh, speaking about with new uh, uh, financial in institutions as new development banks set up by BRICS nations, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank set up by China and others. What's happened? At the end that the authorized capital, paid in capital, all are nominated in the dollars. So that's why we are living within this, uh, uh, this is, uh, framework. So, a couple of examples of how uh, guidelines or principles of uh, responsible behavior of uh, uh, reserve currency nation can look like. Just one first principle is keep your own house in order. I mean economic and financial house in order. The second principle, not harm the interests of economic agents. The biggest uh, harm comes from the so-called secondary nations. When you uh, see uh, economic agents are suffering in the cases where they have nothing to do with the economic, uh, with the foreign policy, with the uh, uh, aims and wishes of uh, nation who is under the sanctions. And the, I, uh, there's a number of other uh, things can be put as the principles for uh, responsible behavior. Do we have examples that we can cooperate within on multi level uh, on multi -lateral level in, in the directions I just described? Yes, we have very good ones. The, the, the best one is the international cooperation on taxation. Just recent episodes, very uh, politically touching issue. I mean taxation, the way it is being paid, the uh, way it is being paid to him. Uh, but we agree. We agree within the OECD, within G20, and uh, the agreement, multilateral agreement, is being implemented by all without any pressure. Every nation uh, takes the responsibility by themselves. So I finish this, but with the uh, hope that uh, my my position is being well understood. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we've had an interesting set of different views. Uh, uh, every speaker has emphasized uh, a different aspect. And now we come to Jean-Claude, the one of us who's actually been there, seen it, and done it, <laughs> and uh, can speak with, a, with an authority. That, uh, <coughs> I, don't know. I don't know whether I, I will speak with authority. Uh, I share, of course, uh, many of the views that have been expressed. I have uh, six points I would like to make uh, first, but very rapidly. First, it is absolutely true that we have a currency which is an hegemon in the present uh, system, but it is not entirely unipolar, and then I am a little bit, uh, I would say, uh, out of uh, the emerging consensus. And of course, we should not forget that the, the structure of the system changed dramatically, I would say, overnight, in January 99, when we created the euro, because before you had one currency, the hegemon, 10 times more important, depending on your criteria, than the other. And that is a system where you can say, well, uh, you don't need to be a great mathematician to see, to, to, to see that it, is, it has a structure which is a totally different nature from the present system, where you have an hegemon, a number two, which is five times the number three, and which is only three times 
less important than the demand one. So we change dramatically, in my opinion, the system of the international currency. So everybody knows the figure. They have been said Forex, 60, 24%, international debt, 60, 22%, international loans, 60, 20. That is the new structure. Now, now, that being said, when I look at the global payment currency, I have different figures which uh, are illustrating the fact that the euro indeed exists. 45% for the dollar, 35%, 34% for the euro, 4% for the yen. That is the proportion in global ca uh, payment currency according to the BIS. So why is there such a difference between the global payment currency and Forex international debt, international loans? Despite the fact that the trends are a little bit different from what was coming out of the discussion until now. When you look at the figures, you see that the dollar had 70% at the very beginning, the day we created the euro. It was 70% in reserve currencies. The euro was as computed as was done by uh, our eminent colleague, uh, 19, so the same level as today in adding up all the currencies. Today it is still 20, but the dollar came from 70 to 60, 62. And all, all other currency gained market share. So there is a trend which is not negligible, at least according to that criteria of reserve currency, which is not uh, hurting the, the euro, but uh, is hurting a little bit the dollar, as I just uh, underlined. So still, of course, the dollar is an hegemon. Uh, hysteresis has been mentioned very wisely uh, uh, as regards uh, the, the reason why when you have had the central position, you keep the central position for a long time. I was amazed myself to see that the copper was traded in sterling until 93, aluminum until 87, tea until 92, coffee until 92, long, long, long after World War II. And if not, not too uh, misinformed, cocoa uh, only after 2015. So hysteresis is there. And uh, of course it's associated with complementarity, but also with the easiness that you have to continue to have the same unique uh, of account if the currency itself remains liquid, of course. Uh, now there is another reason which is dominating and uh, our colleagues were all very eloquent on that. Of course, what counts is your currency, but also the signature behind the currency. The treasuries, if you take the benchmark, the other signatories. And there, of course, we are at a fantastic disadvantage in Europe because it's true that the difference uh, between the volume of the treasuries is uh, very, very important. Uh, the daily trading uh, of treasuries in volume in New York is $500 billion, and the equivalent in Germany, uh, in France, uh, in Italy would be approximately uh, the uh, 1 25th of that level. So we are in totally different universe. Only the creation of a new safe bond would create an element of uh, death and liquidity on the euro market, which would permit to accelerate the transition. And uh, that is really the point. The point is not that the currency has defect, in my opinion. The currency, frankly speaking, I take it as no defect. But the problem, of course, is that uh, the signatories be behind the currency are not the same. Even if you have already euro bonds, the bonds that are uh, issued by uh, the ESM, for instance, or, or uh, uh, the EIB, uh, are uh, good signatories, but of course, it is a very small amount. Now, shall I deplore the fact that we are not at 50-50 vis-a-vis the US dollar? Certainly not, because had it been the case, what would have been the consequence on the exchange market? Which kind of skyrocketing of the euro vis-a-vis -vis the dollar would uh, we have registered? Uh, Unless, of course, it would have been organized with uh, special accounts, uh, the IMF behind, and so forth. But 
if we are in a universe where uh, we are in a free uh, behavior of market participants, of course, it would have been a total catastrophe. So uh, we, we would have become uh, totally uh, out of uh, com cost competitiveness, if I may, in the global uh, um, uh, trade. So I am not unhappy with the way it proceeds. It's, it's a big transformation, but a progressive one. Uh, now, that being said, is it because uh, of the uh, fact that the euro is not yet an international currency of the size of the dollar, that we have problem with Iran, that we have problem with the sanctions of the US and so forth? I don't trust it is the case. I trust the problem is that the United States, for cultural reason and political reason, does not hesitate to blackmail all those who are not participating in the sanctions. And when I look at all the European firms, it is not because they could not settle their trade in dollar that they interrupted totally their trade with Iran. It was because they would lose a lot in their own interest in the United States of America and uh, more largely in the world because the US uh, had uh, a, a lot of uh, legal capacity to, to uh, uh, tease them. So uh, again, the main problem we have, in my opinion, in Europe, if we reason on the Europe balancing the US, is of, of a political nature. Uh, both the treasuries and the safe bonds, which are not there, and the, capa the geopolitical capacity to say, if you blackmail us, <laughs> then we will blackmail you. And uh, let's see that, let's uh, agree that there is no reason that you would impose uh, us, in particular, your own sanctions. Uh, I, it seems to me that it is there that we have the real problem. Iran, the recent Iran, the recent experience of trying to create a special vehicle to bypass the US, the US dollar proved uh, that it was not, a, not the problem. We have no problem to bypass the dollar. We have a real problem to bypass the capacity of the US to impose legally its sanctions everywhere. Now we are stop there, if you permit, John, because I would have some, can I have uh, two, two more? Please, Minutes? go, go okay. ahead. So um, on the future of the system, uh, as many of the speakers, I trust that of course the renminbi, when it is fully convertible, and when there is a clear will to participate with full convertibility in the international monetary system, we'll, we will have necessarily a large multipolar world, and uh, that would be again probably sooner than we think but we are far away, nevertheless, in terms of uh, conditions to be a real uh, international currency. How will we run that? There are several possible assumptions. We could run that as we have run the so-called uh, hegemon, but uh, nevertheless, with a G5 or G7, whatever, uh, from time to time, giving some indications to the market that uh, the dollar is going too low or the dollar is going too high, and I participated in all the uh, such agreements. They, they are very important, they are useful. They were not necessary in the most recent period of time because for reasons that are extremely complex, the international system, the core currencies were relatively stable, even in the worst crisis ever since World War II. So this is something which academia is looking at, but I have no convincing conclusion to understand why we were not trapped in one of these uh, large fluctuations that we had before, uh, and uh, uh, that, that is an open question. But of course, we can imagine that the four, the five major currencies would from time to time give some indications of what they see and uh, tell the market, uh, uh, as we did uh, in the Louvre Agreement, in many such agreements. The last one was uh, the Japanese, uh, 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 G7, G5 agreement, where uh, we gave market important indications, and uh, I was very happy myself to participate in this, uh, in this uh, message to, to, to the market. Uh, we could imagine to have a basket of currencies, uh, and the SDR perhaps could be, if there is a private SDR market, I mean, it means a lot of will to arrive to that uh, consequence. I don't exclude totally that, and it seems to me that the fact that the same definition of price stability is now 
the definition of the major issuing currencies for the present basket of SDR, renminbi being a part, but the four other have more or less the same definition of price stability. It is something which uh, has not been looked at very carefully, but is very important in my uh, understanding. And of course, I eliminate, I have to say, the possibility of the bank or, uh, or and I don't trust that a digital currency, if it is not backed by either a central bank or a pool of central banks, could float. It, you would really need behind those institutions or this institution, which would be responsible for the currency to have all the three characteristics which were mentioned by Jeff and our uh, Aristotelian uh, definition of a currency, if I'm not misled, the, tr the three that you have mentioned. Thank you. Okay, we, we have very little time left, unfortunately, but let's turn to the audience for questions. We'll gather up questions and uh, let's start over here. Mike, please. Please state who you are and your question, and please make it a question and brief. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Randy. I come from Paris, and I study at Le Corps des Mines, which is a public policy program, basically. Um, thank you very much for your, your talk. And most of you have mentioned the challenge of trust. And indeed, since the last financial crisis, we've seen a, a crisis of trust in the monetary system and the rise of ICOs, cryptocurrencies, and my question is, do you believe that such technologies are more as a threat or an opportunity for the existing system? And especially, should we regulate them more or should we leave them as they are? Thank you very much. Thank you. Over here. No, thank you very much, Tatsuo Master. I'm an MB professor from Japan. Fascinating debate, but I'm complete amateur. But the one issue I'd like to ask Mr. Horizon, you talked about something very interesting, independence of central bank from domestic or international pressures. But I think most of central banks are become hostage to the government uh, needs to reinvent the economy, all sorts of things. But if you may, if you pick up top three most independent central bank in the world and why, thank you. Final question over here. No. Thank you, Volker Peretz from Germany. Totally naive question by someone who doesn't understand anything about monetary policy. Would I be totally wrong in assuming that there has never been a hegemonic or reserve currency that wasn't backed up by a very strong military force? Um, I've learned a lot about what the reasons are for the hegemonic position of the dollar, but the military was never mentioned, so I'm just asking that. And if it is not totally wrong, what would that mean for the future of the monetary system, particularly if the euro wants to get in? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody want to comment on the crypto issue? Jean-Claude. <coughs> Very simple. I would say that it is not the absence of trust in the existing currency which uh, has created the uh, try on the cryptocurrencies. I think it's technology. Technology is galloping so rapidly that uh, with uh, a number of uh, fantastic uh, innovation, it appeared that you could uh, run payments and transactions at a very low cost with blockchain and so forth. So it seems to me that it is something which is quite natural. I don't interpret that as uh, an absence of trust for traditional currencies. And as far as trust is concerned, the, the Bitcoin, you could see it goes up and down, up and down. That was more of a speculative instrument. Uh, the try to launch a basket uh, digital uh, then proves that you have to be backed by those traditional currencies that are behind. Mm -hmm. Ellen, you wanted to? Yes, so uh, on, I think, one has to be careful to distinguish between cryptocurrencies and in particular the blockchain technologies like Bitcoin or Ethereum which have to do with proof of work, which in my view are totally harmful and have zero uh, essentially public good aspect to them. 
Why are they zero public good? They are very bad medium of exchange because the transaction costs are extraordinarily high from an energy point of view. So environmental impact is absolutely disastrous. Um, they don't solve any problem. I mean, there was, you know, there, we are pretty good media of exchange, with one exception. I, I, will, I will talk about that in a second. But these things uh, are used to uh, mostly for, you know, the dark, the, the dark net. Uh, so there's, I would say it's negative from a social welfare point of view, and these things should be, for sure, not connected to the um, official system and essentially regulated out. That's very different from digital currencies, okay? Central banks could issue digital currencies, and this is absolutely fine, and you know, the, some central banks are very far along with that. Now, why is there some kind of, uh, of need, maybe, to have some digital currencies or to make some improvement for cross-border transactions? We are still not doing very well. We are doing extremely well for transactions within the EU area. We have extremely good technology, etc. But for cross-border payment, there are still too much of of fees which are taken there by the financial system, and as a result, there are some private actors which may come in. Last thing I want to say about that, one has to distinguish between the technology to do this uh, cross-border transaction and the willingness to create a new currency, such as the Libra. Technology can be good. <laughs> willingness to create a private currency, in my view, that's, uh, that again should be looked at extremely carefully because what, what does the currency provide? I mean, a public currency issued by central banks. We use it for macro policy stabilization, we, and we are careful about financial stability. What is the goal of a private company? Profitability. The public good dimension there is absolutely not there. So we have to be extremely careful with that and distinguish between technology and you know, creating a new, a new currency. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Is somebody, uh, an economic historian among us, have a comment on the military? Uh, <coughs> of course, military influence is playing a big role. No question about this. But I think what's really happened after the Second World War II is the fact that the dollar was the only currency which can be converted into, Gold. into goods. And the convertibility nowadays plays a big, big role in uh, international transactions. But if uh, there's no convertibility in, into goods, meaning that you cannot buy what you want on, on your, when you uh, possess uh, the currency, so it would not help you with any military forces. So thank you. Jeff? There actually is a connection between the two questions because what makes a currency valuable or valid in international payments is the ability of those using it to turn it into real goods and services. And that's why Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are purely speculative. Their value is only based on what people think their value will be in the future. No one stands behind them. Frequent flyer miles have more trust than Bitcoin because at least American Airlines and United stand behind frequent flyer miles. Um, the military angle is precise, is related in the sense that military power is connected to the ability of a government to mobilize resources. And so there's a, a direct connection between military and broader geopolitical power and the expectation that the government will be willing and able to stand behind the currency. After all, there's trust in the Swiss franc and, in it, and its stability, but the country is way too small to exercise the kind of power necessary to provide an international currency, that is the resources to act as a lender of last resort and provide this public good function that people have been talking about. Okay. Did you have a final comment? Yeah, oh, well, uh, before uh, commenting on the central bank's independence, uh, let me see a few words on each um, alternative to the dollar. First, uh, to um, uh, Jean-Claude, um, Euro's market is thinner, as I said. Uh, I was a reserve manager of Japan. Um, uh, when I tried to buy $500 million uh, Tresor or um, uh, Wunsma, Wunz, by one shot, that action would move quotations. You know, that's counterproductive. Agreed. But JJB, US Tresors, so if you have joint markets, no, you know, no such effect. Agreed. Uh, Renminbi, even Chinese want to get a Chinese uh, uh, currency to place their wealth outside the country. Uh, 
how can you, you know, ca can foreigners uh, believe in the integrity of RMB? Simple. SDR has no client base at all because international uh, investors, they can create their own baskets of currency. If you are a small investor, you're tied to your home currency. The, no one is interested in the currency basket SDR. Until now. Until now, yeah. until now, yeah. okay. Yeah. Now, uh, central bank yeah. uh, independence, yeah. It's, sure. it, it's a long story. It will yes. take hours. Yes, so. <laughs> exactly. I could uh, uh, perhaps uh, answer him bilaterally. Okay. John, Final I, would, word. I would put the ECB in the three most independent central bank because they were, <laughs> the question was what are the three most independent? Very good. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much to the panel. They think we can, let me draw a brief conclusion. Very simple. One, you heard the old adage, you can't fight something with nothing. And right now, there's a something, it's the US dollar, and there's nothing else ready now. So a sense that for now, the, state, the system will remain dollar-centric. A sense that there are lots of reasons to wonder if it could be remain this way in the future, but unclear exactly where that leads. It's not obvious what will happen. Mark Carney, in his speech, quoted Rudy Dornbush, late Rudy. Rudy Dornbush of MIT, is saying changes usually take longer than you ever imagined until they actually occur when they happen faster than you thought possible. Could happen here, but Rudy, wonderful as he was, was not a very good policy predictor. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all, and thanks to our panelists.